Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum's webinar and podcast series, Israel Insider with Ashley Perry. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Mr. Ashley Perry, advisor to the Middle East Forum's Israel office. Join us here each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to update us on all the events going on in Israel. Mr. Perry will be giving us a briefing on current Israeli affairs for 15 minutes, then open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And now, with no further ado, I will turn the discussion over to Mr. Ashley Perry. Thank you very much, Stacey, and good evening from Israel. Um, this time next week, we will have an extremely <coughs> excuse me, good idea of what the next Knesset will look like, which party will have achieved uh, what number of seats. Um, and not to say that we'll have particularly, uh, I would predict, a good idea of who will be in the next government, uh, but would at least be able to see something about the permutations or the possibilities of how to form a government and which block seems to have been favoured, um, how well some of the parties have done, what that means going forward. So we've got six days to the elections and really in the last few days, there's been a really a massive amount of uh, really trying to urge the public uh, to vote for various parties, to think differently, uh, to try and move the needle, to try and gain a few seats uh, for yourself for one particular party and try and take away some seats for uh, a possible opponent. Um, we've seen Prime Minister Netanyahu really um, hit the media in a way I said that in a positive way, not attack the media, as he's certainly done in the past, but, <coughs> but uh, appear in pretty much every single uh, Israeli medium there is. He's been on the radio, he's been multiple times on the TV, all the uh, breakfast morning shows, all the evening shows, uh, the internet. He is going live on Facebook probably at least five times a day, holding events up and down the country, really going at it. Uh, some of the others, obviously, they don't have uh, the ability to hold, you know, as this morning, uh, Netanyahu had a sort of what can only be described as a sort of coffee chat with a, uh, a morning presenter, well-known morning presenter, and it was basically just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, there was almost no news, nothing else for half an hour, where Prime Minister Netanyahu basically just uh, regaled the public with his views and responses to various questions and uh, uh, suggestions on issues and policies going forward. Uh, and as we know, uh, in these situations, Prime Minister Netanyahu is extremely, very rarely ruffled. He's extremely well spoken, well prepared, has answers for pretty much any attack, may there be one, or, you know, pertinent question. Uh, and really, this is what we've seen is a couple of things. Uh, we've seen that uh, Likud has basically over the last week has really gone very hard uh, and tried to pick up as many seats as they can from Naftali Bennett's uh, Yamina party. Um, I've heard of uh, many events that Netanyahu has traveled to around the country. There was one near me and uh, his people basically asked just for people who are going to vote for Yamina to come and ask him questions. He basically welcomed it. He said, please, to his local coordinator, please find me the Amina voters and I will come and I will persuade them. Uh, we've really seen this up and down the country. It, it, it makes perfect sense from a strategic point of view. If we look at the, uh, the numbers, uh, we spoke about the religious Zionist party, the party on the right uh, of Yamina, uh, party of uh, Batal Smotrich and Yitzbar Ben Gvir, which Netanyahu for any possible strategy of uh, uh, creating the next coalition, has to ensure that they pass the electoral threshold. And they are just, according to most polls, just over the electoral threshold to the point where there is actually a plan of action. I think I mentioned this last week. There is a plan of action behind the scenes of Likud voters who've been told that if uh, the religious Zionist party is struggling for, uh, for votes, then they will vote for them instead of Likud. Uh, for Prime Minister Netanyahu, he doesn't really have too many other places where he can go to. We spoke last week about the fact that Gidon Saad doesn't really have too many traditional right wing uh, voters, probably out of his 10 or 11 he's currently polling at, I would say about three, no more than four, are uh, disgruntled Likud uh, voters. And by now they've made up their mind that they don't want Prime Minister Netanyahu, so it's going to be very hard to persuade them. And certainly the centre and the left of centre, uh, people who last time voted for blue and white will 
it's very, very unlikely to be able to pull them. Uh, Viktor Liebman's uh, Yeshua Betena party is largely made up of Russian voters, or again, we see from the center or center left people for whom the issue of the ultra orthodox, uh, greater contribution, and the way th uh, the communities uh, behaved over the last year is an issue for them, and they're not going to be persuaded by Netanyahu, who readily sits with the ultra orthodox as their closest allies. So, really, the only place that he could get uh, votes at this point, realistically, significant number of votes, I should say, is in Yamina. And also it makes sense on a strategic uh, level because at the end of the day, he does want uh, Naftali Bennett in his coalition, and he's actually said that many times, uh, but he wants a weakened uh, Bennett. Uh, Naftali Bennett, who is able to achieve 13, 14, 15 seats, is one with great strength who can demand rotation, even though Netanyahu has been at pains to rule that out after the experience that we had with uh, or he had, I should say, with uh, current alternate uh, Prime Minister Benny Gantz. Um, so it really makes sense on so many levels. Probably one of the most surprising developments uh, that we've seen over the last week is the almost consistent uh, polling of four seats from the Ram Islamist party. Up until, I would say, this week, uh, there's been the odd outlying uh, poll, which has shown that they are going over the threshold, but the vast majority showed that they would uh, fall under the threshold. Uh, that seems to have changed in the last few days. Don't forget, Ram is the party which broke off from the joint list, the joint Arab party list, um, and it wasn't expected to pass the threshold, and it certainly was getting closer and closer, but it now seems that it's very, very close, if not over at this point. Now, we talked last week about Naftali Bennett being the kingmaker because he can sit with either side, um, and both sides can basically offer him the moon uh, to sit with them. But now, according to the most recent polls, both sides are getting 58. Again, this was according to one or two polls. Obviously, there's variations to this, but the numbers you know, are that both sides, both blocks, let's say, at the moment, they're sort of put into blocks, where the right-wing uh, religious group, Netanyahu, um, uh, Smotrich, the ultra-Orthodox parties, and Bennett uh, reached 58, and the other side, which is everything from Yisrael Beteinu, Yeshatid, uh, Saar, uh, uh, Benny Gantz, Lapid, uh, and the Meretz, Labour, and the uh, Joint Arab List, together are 58. Where's those other four seats? In the Ram Islamist party. And it's amazing here, we're speaking in 2021, about Prime Minister Netanyahu possibly uh, having a government on the back of an Arab Islamist party. Uh, but that is uh, very possibly what could happen. The leader of that, Mansour Abbas, as we know, has been courted by Netanyahu over the last few months. And Mansour Abbas has specifically said that he will not be beholden to either party, either side, which again is remarkable because, you know, we always consider the joint Arab list to be, you know, as far left as possible, one that's extremely unlikely, but nigh impossible uh, to sit with a right-wing government. And here we have the leader of his, in his Islamist party saying that he doesn't rule out Netanyahu and he doesn't rule uh, out sitting with a, uh, sitting with a right-wing religious party. Um, there obviously are some issues in common, which they have. Uh, Ram, uh, even the, the joint list failed to sign a vote sharing agreement with Ram uh, because of an issue which perhaps they'll find more in common with some of the right-wing religious parties, which is the issue of rights for LGBTQ uh, community. Obviously, a, a, a religious Muslim uh, party is going to have similar views on that to a religious Jewish party. And as we've spoken in the past, vote sharing is uh, agreements are agreements between two parties when the excess votes, when they've reached five or six or 25 seats, uh, you take the excess votes and you take the excess votes of uh, the other side of the agreement, the other party, and together possibly they can make a seat for the, the party which gave the most towards that uh, uh, equation. It's a little bit complicated, but usually it's like-minded parties that sign the agreement. Um, you know, we have Yeshatid with Yeshua Beitainu, we have Yamina, I believe with Gidon Saar, uh, you have the two ultra-Orthodox parties, um, and you would think the two, the two sort of Arab lists running would be able to sign this, but uh, Ram put out a condition that, uh, that anyone who would get that seat based on this uh, vote sharing 
would have to sign an agreement to, uh, to vote in the Knesset based on Islamic values. In other words, that was one of the issues, the, the, uh, the, the, the issue of uh, the rights for, for the gay community to marry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it, they basically made it impossible to sign this uh, vote sharing agreement. So there we are, it's, it's quite remarkable times. And as I said, we really have this position according to polls, at least at this point, where the kingmaker could be Mansour Abbas, the leader of Israel's Islamist uh, uh, party. Um, but again, we will see a lot of things over the next week. And as I've consistently repeated, at least in the last few weeks, that this election will be decided by a few thousand votes, which parties pass the threshold, uh, which parties don't. But most importantly, this election will not be won and lost uh, on March 23rd, that is when we'll hear the results, but the, the, the true winners of this election will then be heard in the days after when the president uh, invites all the leaders of the party, uh, all the leaders of each individual party to uh, ask them which uh, candidate they recommend to be able to form the next coalition. And then we get to the juicy, interesting stuff, uh, the, all the coalition wrangling, or the uh, promises or the back and forth that will go on for at least one to one and a half months, if there is anyone who can even form a government, maybe we'll even have what we had before where there'll be a second candidate offered uh, the possibility of forming a government. So this could go on for months because it doesn't at this point seem like there's going to be a clear winner. If the right wing religious bloc does have its 61, then with Bennett, without Ram, then I think the way the path is relatively clear. Obviously, Bennett will demand a very high price, but it's very possible, in fact, very probable, that Prime Minister Netanyahu will pay it outside, probably, of a rotation. It depends how much uh, Bennett uh, really stands his ground about that, because Netanyahu has been quite specific this week that he will not have another rotation, as he had before. But uh, if Bennett is basically it's do or die time, maybe they'll have to find either some way of convincing him for some sort of rotation or something of equal value. Uh, we don't know what that will be, obviously, because we've had so many unprecedented offers and situations in the last year and a half. But uh, it's clear that if there is 61 with, uh, that Bennett will be able to make, then basically he will then turn back to become the kingmaker and he can almost name his price. Uh, so we'll see exactly. We're all waiting to see in six days when we all, uh, every Israeli over the age of 18, will be able to go and vote and we'll see what the results are. And then we'll have the even, I would argue, more interesting uh, coalition wrangling and building. And, uh, and then we'll see the true winner. And with that, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. All right. Thank you so much. So the first question we have is, um, is there any, I know we talked about this last week, but is there any sign that Biden administration's policies uh, are causing any effect on the Israeli electorate, electorate to shift one way or the other? Um, not really. Uh, they pretty much kept to the background. Uh, there was an interesting uh, quote unquote leak today. And I believe the, uh, is it the, the, the National, I think the Emirati uh, paper, the National, of a memo by the Biden administration on a, what they call a reset uh, with US Palestinian relations. Basically, it seems, again, not having read the original article, but the commentary on it, it seems that um, there's going to be a move back towards the policies of the Obama administration, a move certainly away from the policies of the Trump administration. In fact, it specifically says so in the quotes that I read, uh, where basically we'll go back to uh, the American policy will be uh, for a two-state solution based on the pre-67 lines. And some of the gains uh, that were made uh, will certainly be reversed. Uh, some of them will be point of origin, uh, products of point of origin. That's been a, a, a certainly an issue with Europe uh, to a lesser extent with the US, uh, but the fact that this was mentioned in the article seems that that is something that could be an early step, which means <clears throat> Israeli products that are made over the Green Line, whether in the Golan Heights or the West Bank, uh, will not be able to be labeled fully as made in Israel. That's something which is current Euro uh, European policy. 
has not necessarily been outright American policy, but the fact that it was mentioned in some of the steps that could be made uh, mm -hmm. shows that that's very much on the table. Uh, but on the whole, uh, you know, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been playing up his foreign diplomatic credentials. He has been asked in some of these interviews about his relationship, and he's basically just fell back on the position that, uh, you know, he'll say, uh, you know, he said, myself and President Biden go back many, many years with good friends. Um, and that's pretty much uh, where he's left it, uh, because we haven't really heard too much at this point from uh, President Biden or from his team exactly what's going to happen, what the relationship is going to look like uh, beyond the formalities at this point. So no, it hasn't uh, really gained traction in these elections at this point. Understood. Thank you. Um, also, some stats were published on settlement construction in Judea and Samaria. Does the Israeli right feel that Netanyahu has done enough on this matter over the past few years? It depends how right you go. Uh, the, the hard right, absolutely not. Uh, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, as he invariably does before elections, made a, a promise to the hard right, which is uh, to legalize some of the more, some of the outposts. We know that uh, the overwhelming majority of settlements, Israeli communities over the Green Line, are considered legal. They're, they're built on uh, land, which is uh, where it's legally allowed to be built, with extremely very few exceptions. Uh, but there's a lot of outposts, uh, communities created by creating facts on the ground, people putting up caravans and then expanding the communities. These are not considered legal by the Israeli government. Uh, but Netanyahu, as he's promised in the past, he said that after the election, he will uh, legalize them. Very few people, you know, take that seriously because these kind of promises have been made probably dozens, dozens of times in the past. And this was a prime minister who said during other elections that he will uh, place sovereignty over many of the settlements. And obviously we know that didn't happen. And the likelihood of Prime Minister Netanyahu, who did not legalize any of the outposts under the most friendly president uh, in generations, uh, the likelihood of him being able to do it under a far less friendly administration, let's be honest, it's, it's, it's far less likely. Um, but it's certainly something he's trying to do to try and uh, you know, sort of gain acceptance more amongst, uh, amongst the hard right. Um, so, you know, th th there's very few people on that side who really love Netanyahu. They certainly prefer him to Lapid or people on the left. Uh, they've heard his promises before and they've been let down by them. Uh, so very few people on that side are getting excited about those sort of issues. Uh, but certainly when it comes to it, as Vitzel Smotrich, the, the leader of the hard writers, has said very openly that the only game in town for them is Netanyahu because there is no other option. Uh, and they'll be trying to drive him uh, towards some of these policies in the next government. But at the moment, polling four or five, uh, probably they won't have too much leverage, but that remains to be seen. Thank you. And can you say something about Netanyahu's canceled trip to the UAE? Will it happen before the election? Uh, multiple. Uh, council trip, I should say. I think it's the fourth time. Well, there was suddenly rumours again that he was going to go tomorrow. Uh, for, but from the best of my knowledge, and I've actually spoken to some people out in the Emirates about this, uh, they are extremely annoyed that they feel that they're being used as a tool for Netanyahu's uh, election campaign. Uh, you know, it, it's remarkable, for, you know, if, if he would travel tomorrow five days before the elections, or basically a photo op, uh, at one point he did have his whole schedule cancelled for tomorrow. Uh, and the plane that was supposed to bring him in last week, if you remember the Jordanians cancelled it, was actually spotted. I don't know who these people are, but apparently there's people who spend all day uh, on these maps looking at planes coming in and out and trying to read things into it. But apparently the private plane that was supposed to, was brought in last time, eventually it wasn't used because of the uh, problem with the Jordanians, but it actually made its way back to Israel. And the fact that uh, Netanyahu cancelled all this engagement tomorrow showed that it was very serious, but the, uh, from what I understand, the Emirates have basically said no. They do, they're extremely angry about the situation that they're being used as, a, and the whole normalization agreement is being used as a prop for Netanyahu. Uh, they basically, to the best of my knowledge at this point, have canceled uh, any possible meeting, uh, even though the head of the Mossad, as we spoke about last week, has been used or utilized very much to try and get this photo up, to try and get this handshake. Um, but it doesn't seem like it's going to happen before the elections in the end. 
Thank you. And there's along those lines, there's some claims that net Netanyahu claims that additional four Arab states are about to agree to diplomatic relations without naming them. Do you know anything more about this? I actually had uh, someone in a, a relatively uh, important position in a foreign government ask me about this. And I said, what you should know about Israeli elections as any elections, take everything that's said with a heaping spoon of salt. It's really, you know, it's these are the four countries that were probably very close. Um, if President Trump would have won re-election, probably we would be on our way, maybe even one or two more. Uh, I think Mauritania, uh, Indonesia, I can't, remember, I can't remember if the Saudis were in there. But these are countries which are not a million miles away from uh, recognizing Israel, having some relations with Israel. Um, we don't see, even though there have been comments by the Biden administration about some sort of continuation of the Abraham Accords, we certainly won't see the, uh, the attention uh, given to these, certainly at the expense of the Palestinian issue, as, as it was under the Trump administration. So I don't see it happening uh, in, in, in the immediate future. Uh, things could change and certainly could happen in the medium uh, future, but I think it would really need uh, tremendous engagement from the Americans. Uh, and I don't see that at this point, uh, because as we saw with all the four agreements before, it was mostly American engagement that brought them over the line. Israel was brought in at the last minute to shake hands, to, to sign the agreements, but it was tremendous, you know, uh, the ability of the Trump administration and, and the people uh, involved in this, Kushner and others, and the offers that were made and the deals that were made they really made these uh, these normalization agreements happen, uh, which I just don't see at this point under the Biden administration. But, uh, uh, you know, he, he was right to say that these are things that could happen. But uh, anyone who believes that these are happening in the coming days or weeks, uh, I think it, it is very unlikely. Thank you. And regarding Netanyahu's legal issues, what would happen if he forms a government and afterwards is found guilty? Well, first of all, um, even if he is found guilty, I, I, not being an expert in uh, the legal arena, uh, just speaking to people, they say that even if he is found guilty, there will be multiple appeals, and this situation could go on for years and years. Uh, so this is not happening in the near future. Uh, what could happen is if he does get his 61, Netanyahu, uh, there's been a lot of talk about this, um, is that he will then try and pass laws in the Knesset or basically make the court case irrelevant. Uh, passing what's been called in Israel, the, <clears throat> the French law, uh, which is based on, I believe, a law in France where the head of, uh, the head of government uh, cannot be indicted or cannot be in a criminal investigation while uh, sitting in their position. Uh, and that will obviously be placed retroactively. Basically, this has been Netanyahu's main goal for at least a year and a half. This is what he spent much of the uh, period of coalition negotiations on to try and see whether he could get these laws through. He himself has said he will not pass it, but then didn't deny that there are other people within his party government who could. So basically, we all know the game. If Netanyahu gets a 61 and no one in that 61 uh, puts a veto on this, uh, that's what will probably happen. There'll be laws that will be passed that will basically uh, put off the criminal trial at least until after he's in office. Thank you. Uh, if Netanyahu were out of the picture, would the right wing bloc easily be able to form a government? Uh, yes, basically. Uh, not as well as uh, we think at the moment. You know, according to the polls, any party which is considered right wing would, together, they'd probably make around 80 seats. But as I, I said uh, in my earlier remarks, a lot of the votes that are going to people like Saar, like Liebman, and even Bennett to a certain extent are from the left and left of center. Um, if Netanyahu left the scene and maybe the left wing bloc would strengthen, then they'd probably return. A lot of these left and left of center votes are voting for these right wing parties because they believe that they can be an alternative to Netanyahu because it's sort of known in Israel that really it's highly unlikely that the left, certainly in these elections, will be able to rule on its own. So the alternative, as, as Saar has been trying to make clear, is from the right. Uh, so he's managed to capture a lot of left, center-left center uh, votes, and to a lesser extent, Liebman and 
and Bennett. So it's not as clear that they would get 80 seats, but it's clear that the right wing is in, is in its ascendancy. And I do believe that, uh, yes, and most people know that if Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, left, uh, the right wing would be able to form a government. The Likud would certainly lose a lot of seats and they would go to some of these other parties on the right, but it would be far, far easier to form a right wing government. Thank you so much. And one more theoretical question here. Suppose Israel offered the PA to join the Arab Accor or Abraham Accords. How would the Arab bloc react? Which Arab bloc? Suppose yeah. the joint Arab the list. Um, I mean, it's a very theoretical. I mean, you know, the, the Palestinian leadership won't even sit in the negotiating room. Uh, don't forget they have their own elections coming up in the summer and there's lots going on there with Hamas and Fatah and whether Fatah are going to allow other parties to run and who's going to run. And, you know, so they have to take probably over the next few months an even more bellicose line towards Israel. So I don't see any negotiations happening until after these elections. In fact, according to some reports, there's even pressure by the Israelis and Americans and others to try and put off the elections because they believe that Hamas actually may uh, gain power, may be a little bit too popular at this point. Um, so there's a certain worry about that, uh, but certainly we will not see Fatah making any conciliatory steps uh, negotiating with Israel. Um, but I think that if, if Mahmoud Abbas, by some miracle, decided he was going to negotiate with Israel, join the Abraham Accords, as it were, uh, the joint list certainly wouldn't outflank him uh, and say, you know, they would probably just sit and wait and see. Uh, but that, as you said, that is <laughs> such a theoretical question as... Uh, as, as possibly you can get at this point. Always in interesting to think about though. Uh, so how have the peace agreements with the UAE and Bahrain affected the peace, cold pieces with Jordan and Egypt? It's an interesting question. I think they actually, to my mind, they, they stand in stark reality. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, our relationship with Egypt and Jordan is largely strategic. It's based on shared uh, security interests, you know, Jordan, the relationship is, you know, the, with the king, not even with the parliament, not even with the government, it's with the king. And really, you know, the king knows that without Israel's intelligence and without its uh, possible military support, uh, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan would certainly be in a lot of trouble. You know, it's threatened uh, on many of its borders by extremists, by terrorist organizations by other regimes who would love to get a foothold into Jordan. Jordan is not a particularly strong country, militarily and otherwise, economically certainly they've taken in, you know, it's 10 years since the Syrian uprising and it's the country which has taken in the most Syrian refugees. Uh, it's a country really struggling, it's 70% Palestinian. Uh, the rest are Bedouin tribes, which uh, are, are under his father, King Abdullah's father, King Hussein, he knew how to deal with them very, very well. And, and that was the backbone of his uh, leadership and uh, King Abdullah certainly was Western oriented, Western educated, certainly hasn't been able to deal with him uh, as much. So probably that's why we've seen a more bellicose line from uh, Jordan in recent years, um, because they have to sort of play into this anti-normalization uh, sort of uh, agenda, which many in Jordan have. In Egypt, it's not markedly different, uh, but certainly what we're seeing in the UAE I experienced it personally when I was out there and my friends who have been to Bahrain, they see a warmth on the streets from the people. You know, this is, these are probably the first Arab states where we've really seen a warmth to, from the people. It's not just a strategic alliance at the highest levels. It's really something that they, they're excited about and they want to see more of. And we see these collaboration agreements. And we, as I said, we saw this 10 billion uh, agreement uh, to invest in Israel's uh, high tech and R and uh, we could never see anything like that uh, from Jordan and Egypt, first of all, financially, and second of all, to invest so openly and proudly in the Israeli economy would be something that would cause outrage in those two countries. So it's definitely uh, really put those two agreements, uh, long-standing agreements, uh, into stark focus, um, because certainly in the future, Israel needs more of the latter agreements, and less of the, not to say less, not to say that we want to get rid of ourselves of the Egyptian and Jordanian peace agreements, but certainly we're looking for more uh, warm agreements, uh, not just at the highest levels, not just top down, but also bottom up. 
Thank you so much. And for our final question of the day, do you think a Netanyahu Lapid Lapid debate will take place? Very unlikely. Neither side really want it. Um, you know, both will say that they want it, but then they suddenly put in all these conditions that they know are unlikely. At the moment, they're talking about having, you know, they, they, they'll both agree to it until they find a moderator that they can both agree on. I can't imagine that they'll find such a person, especially within a few days to go. Um, it'd be interesting, um, but, you know, we don't really... As, as, as I've explained many times before, we don't have a presidential system. So it's not sort of, you know, you know, it's clear in the American system who's running for president. There's two people running for president, so it makes sense to have a debate. In Israel, we vote for parties. We don't have a presidential system. Many people could argue Bennett could then get in and say, well, I'm also running for prime minister. I mean, it's unlikely he'll be able to form a government, but he, he claims that he's running for prime minister. So why shouldn't he also be invited to the debate? So. I think it's, it's, it's at this point, it's a lot of talk. Uh, it's a lot of saber rattling. It'd certainly be interesting to, to watch, but I think with six days to go before the elections and don't forget in Israel, um, I think even from Saturday night, there's no, uh, there, there's certain limitations on uh, open campaigning. Uh, so basically, you know, the, the, the time for such a thing is so minimal that uh, it's, it's highly unlikely it's going to happen. Understood. Well, thank you so much. We've come to the close of our webinar and podcast today. Ashley, thank you again for taking time to speak with us. For our viewers and listeners, please join us Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern for our one-year anniversary of our speaker webinar series with a webinar from Elliot Abrams discussing Biden and Iran two months in. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a great day.